So thank you everybody <laughs> for being here this, uh, this evening. At, at this time, the board will now conduct a closed session as permitted by KRS 61.8101C and KRS 61.8101K of the Open Meetings Act for the purpose of discussions relating to pending litigation and the formative discussions of the superintendent's evaluation. Is there a motion to go into the closed session, please? Move. Second. Was Mr. Craig first or Shul, Dr. Shul? Uh, I'd, be, I'd, I'd be Dr. Shul, definitely. Okay, all right, and Ms. Duncan, thank you. And um, I will take a quick vote to see where we are with going into the closed session. And I'll start, Ms. McIntosh, I'm not gonna keep picking on you and starting with you all the time. I know I did that last, last time. I'm, I'm sorry, I have to start somewhere. So Dr. Chris, I'm starting with you tonight. Your vote? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Craig? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Duncan? Yes. Thank you. Dr. Shule? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. McIntosh? Yes. Thank you, Diane Porter. Yes, it's unanimous. And so we are now uh, going into a closed session and I will uh, see you in just a minute as you leave this session and join us in the other session. Thank you. Okay, if everyone's ready, I would like to call the uh, January 19th meeting of the Jefferson County Board of Education to order. Uh, before we start with the, um, our um, meeting agenda, a few remarks I'd like to make. Um, I'd like to start our meeting with two quotes from um, Muhammad Ali, who is a native of Louisville, who we have celebrated in the last couple of days. And I'm gonna end with some quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But Muhammad Ali said, service to others is the rent that you pay for your room here on earth. And don't count the days, make the days count. And I want to uh, emphasize the service quote because our board are um, people who provide service to our district. This is board recognition month. And so I want to give them uh, praise again at this board meeting. And I will say that uh, our board works very hard as well as the superintendent and the JCPS staff. Uh, everyone is working very hard as we work through this pandemic. So I think we truly although we're counting the days, we're counting to get to the end of the pandemic as we move forward. I do honor the Board of Education and I'm not, I don't have any little um, quick quizzes for this evening, but I want to highlight the words that you gave at the last meeting as to why uh, this board is here, why you were elected and why you want to serve public education. And I will put the words out that everybody used at the last meeting very quickly and the words were kids, justice, student success, supporting our children, confidence for learning, determination, dedicated and passionate. So I would like to thank this board tonight and every day for the service that you provide to the Jefferson County Public School District. So thank you very much. It is our month to honor you. I can't do it every day, but I certainly will have done it at both of these meetings. So thank you for your work. Moving forward, is there a recommendation for the approval of the meeting agenda for this evening, please? Is there a motion? Craig moves. Board member Craig, and it's seconded by? Marshall. Board member Marshall, thank you. And I will call for the vote at this time, starting with Dr. Chris. Yes, sorry, still not used to it. going first. Yes, Dr. Chris, yes, thank you. Uh, Board Member Craig? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Board Member Marshall? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Board Member Duncan? Yes. Thank you. Dr. Shull? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And Board Member McIntosh? Board Member McIntosh? I'm still here. I apologize. Yes. Okay, thank you. And Diane Porter is a yes. So that uh, passes unanimously. And then is there a recommendation for the approval of the minutes of uh, the 
meeting of uh, January 5th meeting. Is there a motion, please? Marshall. Board member Marshall, seconded by? Call. <laughs> okay, Dr. Chris, thank you. I will call for the vote, starting with Dr. Chris. Yes. Thank you. Board member Craig? Yes. Thank you. Uh, board member Marshall? Yes. Thank you. Board member Duncan? Yes. Thank you. Dr. Shule? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Board member McIntosh? Yes. Thank you. Diane Porter? Yes, it passes unanimously. It's my honor and my privilege and pleasure this evening to introduce our superintendent, Dr. Marty Polio, for the superintendent's report. Dr. Polio. Thank you, Chair Porter and board members. Tonight, I bring you the superintendent report for January 19th, 2021. Um, and tonight, and as we know, all board meetings are important, but um, tonight is an important board meeting as the next few we know will be. Uh, I'm honored and excited to bring you the update about the vaccination tonight of the JCPS family. I've spent the last two Fridays at Broadbent Arena. First Friday, seeing our nurses uh, get vaccinated, 36 of our nurses. And then this past Friday, when we got the news that we were one week away from beginning um, our employee, school-based employee vaccination. So it's an, it's an exciting time. And three days from today, we will be out there again today as our first employees, school-based employees will begin getting vaccinated. And we know it's been a long road to get here, um, but as it's probably off uh, used way too much, the light at the end of the tunnel, but it is getting brighter for us right now. So this Friday, we will begin with our elementary school-based employees um, going by schools in alphabetical order. So as you see those like Alex R. Kennedy, um, Audubon, um, Atkinson Elementary, those are first on the list. I believe this Friday we will run through almost clearing the seas uh, with our elementary school. So we will run about 1,200 a day. Um, that's what approximately 1,200 of our employees. And it should approximately take us 10 to 12 days to get through all of our employees to be vaccinated, the thir nearly 13,000 that requested those vaccinations. And I know we will be covering this later, but sometimes people don't stay with us always. So I wanna make sure to highlight these in the superintendent report. Um, so as the governor stated, we hope to have our school-based employees through the first round of vaccines by Friday, February 5th, give or take a few days. Um, so that is our goal as we have worked with the local health department to establish the guidelines for beginning this process. We would then provide the booster 28 days later as we will be getting the Moderna vaccine. And so 28 late days later, obviously based on supplies, um, and that will be the federal government's um, work in order to get us the booster. But 28 days later, it is the plan that we would have the booster vaccine, the second shot available for our JCPS employees. Um, and if that does become the case, which we believe it will, we will begin the booster February 19th for those that are beginning this Friday through March 5th. Um, and our goal would be that every single employee in JCPS uh, that has requested this 13,000 uh, approximately will have the booster completed by March 5th. Um, and at the conclusion of that vaccination period, we will bring you a back to school plan. Uh, actually the conclusion of the first round. In between the first round and the booster, we will bring you what would be a recommended back to school plan. Obviously that will be your call as to when we begin that. And we will also continue to monitor data. So if we get a decrease, we could ex expedite that. But I do believe this is great news. Um, and we are seeing an opportunity to have all of our staff vaccinated. And I wanna take this opportunity and I know that leadership during this time is not easy. It has been very difficult across America to lead during this difficult time, no matter what position that may be. And I go through each and every school district that has been closed this entire time. And the vast majority of large school districts have been closed since last March. And it has been tough on superintendents across America. And I know it's probably been tough on Dr. Stack, but I wanna thank him, our state health department and Governor Bashir for valuing K through 12 education with this vaccine, because they have put us up in 1B as you will see, which means we are getting close to the end of this road. And I'm excited to be able to bring you a recommendation in the near future 
uh, based on this vaccination to hopefully return to school. Also tonight, you will hear a presentation um, on us moving forward out of our corrective action plan with KDE releasing us from any oversight, including assistance um, or state management. And we know it's not as big as it was uh, two years ago, but those that were on this board remember uh, that what we went through two and a half years ago when state management was recommended, we got an agreement. And I can't underscore enough the work that has taken place in this district, the employees at the school level and the district level who have put such hard work into ensuring that we were successful in these 276 corrective items. Um, we're not all the way there yet, but I am proud of the work that has taken place where we can now do this on our own. And we will talk to you tonight about how we will move forward and monitor that progress over the coming months to ensure that we don't go backwards, we only go forwards. And then finally tonight, we'll present you with the draft budget. And this is our first look for our board members at the 21-22 budget and a high level view of that budget. And so you will see that tonight, but what I wanted to highlight in the superintendent report is I'm very pleased that the federal government has stepped up and provided significant financial support to all school districts in the United States. And you will hear about those fundings that we will get, for lack of a better term, through CARES Act II, that second stimulus funding that was approved in late December. Um, that is going to give us substantial funding Yes, for PPE so that we can continue to provide that because by the time we get to the end of this year, we will have spent more money than we brought in in that first CARES Act package. But more importantly, it's gonna give us the opportunity to provide our supports to kids, additional learning for kids, mental health supports for our children, re-engaging them over the next two and a half years. Um, and this is what will help us recover um, lost learning for our students over the next two and a half years. We'll be able to bridge the digital divide for that period of time for all of our students, which we wouldn't have been able to do prior to this. This funding is based upon student needs, specifically free and reduced lunch in a district. And I think you can see one of the, I think, significant findings from the number that we are getting from the federal government is the fact of how many students in poverty we have in this community. And with the number that we are getting, $178 million in order to support learning over the next three years, that is very indicative of the amount of students that we have in poverty in this district that we must step up and meet the needs. Namely, nearly two thirds of our students prior to the pandemic qualified for free and reduced lunch. So this work even after the pandemic is going to be more important than ever. Um, and I want to take this opportunity, and I know often that, um, you know, uh, leadership, as I said, gets criticized, but I do want to thank the federal government and the legislature for stepping up um, and really being a bipartisan package to support public education. So thank you to all of those who supported this um, and making sure that districts all across America, our rural districts, districts surrounding us and urban districts all across America are getting the support that we need to meet the needs of our kids. And I look forward to bringing you back that plan um, in the next several board meetings about how we begin once we come back to school to meet the needs of our kids. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the presentations tonight. Thank you, Dr. Polio. Um, tonight for the action items, there is the recommendation for approval of update on the district response to the COVID pandemic. And uh, Dr. Polio will introduce this to the board, please. Dr. Polio. Thank you, Chair Porter. And we will begin the presentation. And you have seen much of this. Um, it's much of the same information around COVID-19 and the pandemic, but we do have some new information. Specifically, I highlighted some of it around vaccination. And we wanted to make sure that you had a clear understanding of the vaccination plan moving forward um, and how we would do this. And then obviously talk about winter athletics as well, which I know has been something that we said we would discuss and um, uh, make an action item on this specific board meeting. So as we take a look, once again, each and every time we've brought this to you, we've talked about our guiding principles. Once again, I wanna commend the board, health and safety being number one, high quality instruction, being right behind that. And I think this board has followed those recommendations from the very beginning. We know we first dealt with this last March. And for the first time, I believe we truly see an end to this uh, where we can return our kids. 
and our children and our staff to school to meet the needs of our kids. Equity, accurate and timely communication and community trust are all things we've been working hard on as guiding principles throughout this time. Once again, you see the current incidence rate in Kentucky, although over the past couple of days, we've seen a decline. Um, you can see that this was as of 114, but I believe even checking today, there are only two counties right now that do not have that widespread, that critical spread within their county. Um, and I believe um, we are at around the, the 62 per 100,000. So we are still seeing some critical spread um, in our community, but we hope that um, the post-holiday um, gatherings have now, we've had that, and hopefully we will continue to see a decline of cases in our county. So far, the doses received in Kentucky, you can see we've received, this is a significant increase from two weeks ago. This was as of 114, uh, five days ago. So that has increased, but we had 226 that over that doses received in Kentucky and have been administered 143,560 statewide. As I told you before, from the governor's rollout, uh, 1A is not concluded yet. There are still some 1A, especially the booster, uh, but we now know that we have moved into 1B. Um, and you know those three groups that are in 1B, person 70 or older, first responders and K through 12 school personnel. There have been some districts who have already started the K through 12 school personnel. So I wanna reiterate this. This is not a Jefferson County decision. This is not a JCPS decision about when we vaccinate. This was a state health department decision in collaboration with the governor that we appreciate um, and thank them for making K through 12 school personnel a priority in 1B, which every state is not in that particular order. Um, but we begin, as I said, with JCPS this Friday, the 22nd, and as you know, back on 1228, we thought it was going to be February 1st, give or take a week. And so we are exceeding that by starting this on the 22nd. So I can't thank our local health department enough. Like I said, I've been at um, Broadbent Arena and I've been very impressed with the work of our local health department and how they have implemented this. And I can't wait to see our staff starting this process on Friday. Once again, I just wanted to reiterate vaccine, JCPS, we asked our uh, staff to respond to a survey. We had 14,784 responses. Our actual employees, and I, once again, I'll say we have some outside contractors, student teachers, mental health professionals, and some social workers um, that we have added to the list requesting the vaccine. But we have 12,884 who requested the vaccine. So 87% uh, talking to superintendents around the state, um, that's anywhere from 15 to 20% higher than other districts around the state. Just some anecdotal information that I've received from some other superintendents. So our community, our JCPS family has stepped up and said, we wanna do this to get our kids back. Uh, we had about 1900 decline uh, that vaccination. So. Um, and once again, those employees who did not complete the survey were counted as declining the vaccine. Many of those may be part-time uh, employees or retired employees or substitute teachers. Um, but as you can see, very proud of the way our staff has stepped up. So here's where we get into some of the new information. We begin with our vaccinations this Friday, January 22nd. Our local health department has said about 1,200 a day. So if you do the math on that, that's gonna be around 10 working days, maybe 11 working days, depending on ensuring that we get that amount of vaccine, 1200 a day. And so we will continue to monitor that, but it's easy to see that that would be about 10 or 11 days for us to get through all of our 13,000 that have requested that. Um, employees from the same school or department will be scheduled together. So as I said, we're starting with elementary schools and we're starting with the A's. So an example would be Atkinson Elementary will be this Friday um, and they are all going at a similar time scheduled together. We wanna make sure buses are available. At Broadbent, this is a drive-through vaccination site. It takes about 15 minutes to get through and then when an employee is done, they drive out to the outside parking lot and wait there for anywhere between 15 to 30 minutes. So overall, um, with the wait in line, it's about an hour process, but once you pull in, 
um, it, it moves pretty quickly. So I've been very pleased with that. Um, but our employees from the same school and departments will be scheduled together. As I said, it is scheduled and constructed in alphabetical order. There are a few exceptions. So for instance, if we got to 1140 for a day, and there may be a facility or division that has only 20 people, and we don't have a school that would fit that, we may go slightly out of order in order to get right at 1200, because we wanna make sure we use all 1200 every single day. Uh, but once again, we will get through all elementary, all middle and all high. Our plan would be in approximately 10 or 11 days. If we get a little less, it might have to be 12 days. But as I said in my superintendent report, our goal will be to finish by February 5th, the end of that first week in February, then begin the booster 28 days later, starting on February 19th and working through March 5th. Substitutes and other support personnel will be scheduled after elementary schools. Um, so that when we bring a recommendation, um, you know, we do not think it will be much time between elementary, middle, and high. When we were first talking about the vaccine, we didn't know if we would get 6,000 doses and then there may be a four-week gap before we got the next 6,000. That is not the case. Um, you know, we, we should be getting these all during the same two to three-week window. So we shouldn't have our rollout plan to you will not be uh, a great deal of time, but we do want to make it where we can open up elementary and our primary grades first. Middle school and high school will follow elementary in alphabetical order. Once again, we will continue to evaluate a mode of instruction, the metrics. Um, as you know, as I said, we are once again still in that red, um, which once again, the governor did change that on December 14th in the state health department, uh, but we continue to monitor that on a daily basis. So um, we will, once again, our schools are ready. Uh, are, they have done this. We were ready in October to return based on data. Once again, what we plan to do is get through the first uh, vaccination period. And then at our February, one of our February meetings, bring you um, a recommendation for a potential return to school at that time. Um, that would include dates of return based upon that booster the time needed afterwards to begin um, and then to successfully start school um, with our students. And we will bring you specifics on all of that prior to return. But as you can see, uh, we will follow the safety at school guidelines, the healthy at school guidelines with PPE, social distancing, screening and exclusion, sanitation and the environment, contact tracing. These will all continue to be a part um, of our world at school for the foreseeable future. Uh, the remainder of this school year, that will take place. We will have masks, uh, social distancing, all the PPE requirements, uh, most likely for the remainder of this school year and quite possibly into next school year. Um, these are things that we will continue to follow, but the guidelines are on our JCPS website. Um, and then there's the school specific plans and, and families can still go on to those school specific plans. They've created plans for arrival and dismissal. Uh, how we will take uh, temperatures of students, how we will have breakfast and lunch, classroom, common areas, isolation rooms, if needed. All of those aspects are on our website, uh, but we want everyone to know that we are ready to go. Our schools are ready to go. They are prepared. We have the PPE ready to go, and it is a matter of making sure that um, we have the uh, either the vaccinations or the data to support a return to school. Um, and we look forward to that recommendation to you and getting back to school um, as quickly as we possibly can. And so finally, what I wanted to talk about tonight also where the action item may be in place is a winter sports option. Um, we know we discussed this at our last meeting. Um, we had three options at that time and really we are down to this option um, because the other two dealt with um, what we did take one of them, which was phase three. Um, that segment three, which is what we've been working on over the past um, several weeks. An option we are bringing to you tonight is that we could begin tomorrow. Our winter sports could begin practice um, following the guidelines that our athletic directors um, and uh, the KHSAA have put out that they used in the fall as well. February 1st would begin games. And then based on the sport, there would be about a three 
our four week season based upon which sport it is. They would mostly be playing district games and then postseason. Uh, but obviously we would revisit this, you, this with you as data changes along the way. Uh, we do provide, once again, Ms. Porter had a question about activity buses. Um, we do provide transportation. We will be providing transportation with activity buses. We will clean the buses. We will ensure um, that we follow the guidelines that the KHSA and KDE has provided um, with us. But this would be the winter sport option that we would propose to you and that I recommend uh, to you tonight. I know it's a very difficult and challenging decision. Once again, I want to say I don't want um, JCPS student athletes being the only athletes in the state of Kentucky not able to participate. We want to give them the opportunity just like we did in the fall, but I understand and know the difficulty and challenge in making these decisions. Uh, but once again, we would bring an update back to you at every board meeting based on that data um, and ensure that um, we are being healthy, obviously, in competition, just like we would be at school. So at this time, I'm happy to take any feedback or questions that you have about the vaccinations, the data, or winter sports athletics. Thank you, Dr. Polio. At this time, I will uh, uh, ask board member Craig to go first, please. I see your hand up. I've got lots of thoughts on everything that Dr. Polio uh, put forward. My question for you, Chair Porter, is whether I should address them all or if we should talk about vaccinations and return to school first and winter sports second. Um, and I'll let you guide me as to how much I share here. I think we all have received numerous emails in the last few days about both of those uh, topics. So I think we should go with return to school first questions and then uh, do the sports questions after that because um, a, lots of e a lot of emails have come in. I have looked at my phone starting at four o'clock today. I have gotten emails that I am unable to read because we started at 4.30. So I don't want parents to think that we're not looking at them, but we are trying to be uh, responsive to them. So uh, if there's no concern from others, is it okay on the board from the board members that we start with the return to school questions first and then do the sports questions second? Okay, I see a couple of yeses. I'm gonna make that uh, a major my, my majority at this moment. So board member Craig, if you wanna uh, start with the back to school questions, please. Sure, um, and I have some comments. I don't have a lot of questions. Um, I am amazed at the way that this appears to be un unfolding. Um, the board was receiving um, information, I think at the same time that the rest of the community was at the end of last week about the vaccinations for teachers, which is not uh, a criticism. I just, it appears that everything is happening so quickly, um, but also um, is happening in a well-organized manner to make this happen that um, I appreciate the efforts that the superintendent has made, that the governor has made, uh, that the federal government has made to ensure that these doses are available to JCPS the teachers and support staff and uh, student facing personnel um, to ensure that this um, is possible. Um, I know that at some point we're going to be posed with the question of whether or not we are going to return to school um, after all of our staff are vaccinated um, and I will wait um, for the re superintendent's recommendation on that, but I am anxious to get back into the classroom when it is safe to do so. Um, and I'll reiterate here the point that I've made on other topics uh, as we've debated COVID-19 over the last several months. Um, if our teachers and our staff are vaccinated and if no one else in the community is willing to make the sacrifice that is needed to curb the spread of the disease in the community, um, that I would be frustrated for our students to be the only ones making that sacrifice. So um, I would very much favor a recommendation for the return to school once all of our staff and personnel are um, vaccinated, but obviously we'll wait anxiously for the superintendent's recommendation on whether or not the district is um, ready to do so when we hear from him in the middle of February. So thank you for that. And I'll have more on sports later. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments as it pertains to returning to school uh, from board members? Uh, Dr. Chris and then Ms. Duncan. 
Um, these are mostly questions uh, that I've gotten from various people and I didn't know the answer to, so I just thought I'd throw them out here now. Do we, uh, as we look at accommodations for teachers and, and other JCPS staff, is there a special category or what category do uh, pregnant teachers fall into or pregnant staff members? Do they get accommodations automatically or is that kind of on a case-by-case -case basis? I'm going to let General Counsel Brown take a stab at that, if you don't mind, Kevin. Sure. There's a Kentucky uh, Pregnant Pregnancy Protection Act or, or some similar name that's in effect that we obviously abide by. It mirrors similar language to the Americans with Disabilities Act, but it you know dives into some specific issues um, that uh, someone could encounter in the workplace if they're pregnant. Uh, but this, the standard is the same of reasonableness for the accommodation. So those work hand in hand, ADA and the Kentucky Act. Uh, and so that's that, those are our guiding principles on that. And generally accommodations are uh, uh, reasonable and uh, cannot uh, have an undue burden on the operation of the, of the business or the governmental entity. Do we have we had internal discussions about where we come down on the reasonable reasonableness <laughs> criteria? Yeah, we're uh, having those discussions. Um, obviously, <clears throat> when we and I will say the other thing that factors into that is if there's an executive order from the governor in effect that also outlines um, high risk uh, an employee that may be high risk for several conditions, and we do have an executive order in effect right now. So you have to look at all three of those things. Um, uh, for example, if we were to start school back tomorrow, that governor's executive order would be in effect because we would be going back to school in an orange or a red county without a vaccine. When the vaccines come, the executive order um, drops off, but there could be another executive order. But, but to answer your question, yes, we are having those conversations. Uh, if, if the, when the district is uh, fully uh, uh, virtual as we are now, it is not a burden upon the district and the employer to provide an accommodation for literally everyone to have, uh, for example, to work remotely. As we um, go along the way and we become more and more in person, then that burden rises uh, along mm -hmm. with that and, and gradually increases is how I would look at it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. What, you know, have we thought about, um, you know, of course, there's a, a large number of JCPS staff that are going to qualify for accommodations. Um, but and then there is probably a large number of JCPS staff that are fine coming back to work after they're vaccinated. And then there's probably this in between group who, you know, doesn't qualify for accommodations, but isn't exactly comfortable going back to work yet. Um, have we thought about any ways to kind of process or work with that middle group or is it is it legally possible you know to 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 do so or or how are we approaching that question of people that you know um do not do not qualify for accommodations but aren't really comfortable going back to work for one reason or another in person work I'll start that out and we may need uh, you, Dr. Polio or uh, Jimmy Adams to chime in. The district's been very good and I compare that to maybe how some other entities have handled it from the very beginning of the pandemic, Jefferson County, this district has been very good in soliciting uh, the employees to say, do you need an accommodation? And that we use that term accommodation uh, very loosely to mean, do you, do you have an issue that you think is going to uh, interfere with your ability to provide services during a during the pandemic. And so we've had, and as you all know, thousands of people who have said yes. Um, and so those numbers will tend to start to <clears throat> lower, and we believe they already are lowering because of the, the availability of the vaccine. But even if uh, an employee is still raising their hand that, yes, I need an accommodation, we have an obligation to, to engage with them by email through, normally it would be a meeting, uh, mm -hmm. with folks in Jimmy's office. It's called the interactive process through the Americans with Disabilities Act to have that conversation about whether or not you have that disability. So there will be some people that, uh, you know, maybe they don't have the disability that qualifies, uh, but we would have that conversation. And there are other ways uh, to accommodate employees uh, outside of just providing a, an opportunity for them to work virtually. Uh, and 
yeah. uh, their employers are beginning to explore those different things. And that's the whole point of the interactive process is to have that conversation with the employee uh, to see what might uh, be of benefit to them in their workplace. And I'll just add to that briefly. I think it's important to note. I mean, we will follow the law and the guidelines on this without a doubt. Um, you know, it, it would be very difficult without the vaccine um, to say whether you're comfortable or not, you're coming back to work. And I think districts all over are dealing with that. But now that we have the vaccine and following the guidelines, I think we have to cross reference with that vaccine. We want to support our employees and those that get accommodations, make sure that we meet those accommodations and support them with safety and health. Uh, but also we have to know that um, school can be impossible to run if we don't have the uh, number of employees to ensure a safe environment. So as a principal knowing, as a high school principal, you know, I couldn't have 30 people out in a day and expect uh, to be able to hold class in school and provide a safe environment. So, um, you know, we will have to, once again, as, as Kevin said, take each situation separately um, and have a meeting with that person to see what accommodation they would get. Yeah, I, you know, and I, I just want us to be attentive to those uh, folks and do our best to work with them. I mean, there's, you know, the vaccine is going to be an awesome thing, but, you know, there's there's several shortcomings of it or not shortcomings, but why it's not a, a cure all. You know, I mean, kids can't get the vaccine, so they're still going to spread COVID. Obviously, even people that get the vaccine, you know, are probably still going to spread COVID. They just won't get as severe of a case. You know, obviously, uh, teacher, it's good that, that K through 12 personnel are near the front of the line for the vaccine. But that also means that there's probably going to be a lot of people in their households that are not going to be vaccinated, you know, at the on the same time frame that our JCPS employees are vaccinated. So they've got to worry about transmitting it uh, to their uh, to their family members um, who, who may not be vaccinated. And then, you know, the community transmission is still super high. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that kind of exacerbates those uh, worries for our employees that I have. Um, so um, uh, just, this is a kind of a, a, a different track question, but um, related to, I had a teacher ask me this and it's a teacher that doesn't throw crazy stuff out there usually. So not that teachers do, but, um, uh, if a kid damages a Chromebook um, at home while they're using it, what's we don't ask any questions, do we? Or do we just replace that for them? Or how, do, how does that work? Well, um, no. I mean, if, if, you know, obviously we will have to take some cases separately if there's some intentionality in it. But no, if it is sure. just a Chromebook that uh, they dropped or something of that right. nature, um, we would not charge the student for that. I think some of our schools may need to get that message a little bit more uh, clearly. Um, um, so I just wanted to, to make you uh, okay. aware of that. Um, and then I, I'm kind of struggling which questions go here and which go later. So apologies if um, I'm jumping ahead to, to the later questions. Um, one of the things that, you know, as, as I think about returning to school in person at some point, this uh, this school year, uh, in addition to the things I mentioned before, you know, depending on which teachers, uh, you know, get accommodations, uh, and, and correct me if I'm saying anything that's that's wrong, but many of our students probably won't get the same teacher if they go back to in person that they had virtually up to this point during during the year, and I don't know what percentage that is, but is it? Do you think it's fairly safe to say that a you know some percentage, uh, non-minimal percentage of our students will have a different teacher when they go back in person? I mean, I think it would be impossible for us not to say that there would be there wouldn't be some movement. We would encourage our schools and do encourage them to keep as much as possible with consistency. Uh, yeah. But there's no way that I could ensure that. So yes, I would say that's safe to say there would be some change. Yeah, and just more broadly, you know, uh, with the consistency issue, um, you know, there's going to be a, an adjustment period, of course, if, if we do go back to in-person, 
Um, the biggest adjustment, you know, may be if you get a different teacher, um, uh, but there are all kinds of other adjustments that, that people are going to have to make. And I really wonder, you know, despite the shortcomings of remote learning, um, if consistency uh, of instructional method um, is not something that we should give more weight to as we weigh uh, going back to in-person instruction or not, um, you know, is the disruption to, to what now kids have gotten used to, despite its, you know, shortcomings, is disrupting that routine. Um, does that have some negative consequences that we, we, we may not be uh, fully, fully considering? So uh, I'll stop there with my questions and points and save the rest of them for the sports discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next board member that has questions, I think it was Ms. Duncan, you're next. Yes, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm like Chris. I, one of the questions that I've been asked is about the coaches and because they're working with our kids right now and this vaccination schedule um, doesn't put coaches, uh, you know, pretty far into this. Uh, we have, they have to wait a while. And um, I, I'm just wondering if we have considered that or we're just saying, oh, well, it will, it will work itself out um, when their day comes, then they will be there. Um, but has, there, has anybody um, made any special arrangements for people who are working with kids right now? Well, I think the, the problem with that, Ms. Duncan, first of all, they're grouped by schools. That's the way the health department requested it. Um, and so they come in by schools. And then secondarily, you know, we would be talking about a 28 day booster. Uh, so I don't know if that could impact winter sports. I think it could impact spring sports, definitely, um, as we look to the groups of, of employees at a school getting vaccinated. But I don't think that winter sports could be impacted by that. Um, when you say March 5th, um, I'm assuming we're saying that the last staff person would be vaccinated on March 5th. And then from that point, we're counting 14 days to then resume in person on March 19th. Is that right? We're still waiting for clarification on exactly how many days after the second booster. There is some disagreement on that. We will bring you obviously expertise and maybe even bring back uh, Dr. White and Dr. Moyer to um, our board meeting when we discuss this so that they can talk about what they know about this. I will say this, yes, the goal is February 5th to have the first one, March 5th to have everybody through on the second one. We, we are um, encouraged that that will be the timeline, but once again, um, you know, that is just a goal. It will be based upon that we get the vaccination supply locally that we believe that they said we're gonna get. So lots of things can happen between now and February 19th when we begin the booster. So that will be contingent on the local health department getting those, uh, the doses that would supply that. But that, that is what we believe to happen, to be happening at this point. So it looks like the earliest, um that we would be back in person would be around March 19th. If everything went smoothly and there weren't interruptions, the earliest would be March 19th. I'll just say, I would think mid-March would be based on the vaccine and not the change in data. I mean, we could come back to you if there is a significant change in data um, and a decline that it could be a different scenario. Based on the vaccine, we are looking at a mid-March date. I don't know exactly what that day is yet though. All right. Um, these to me are medical decisions um, <laughs> that we need the doctors to say, okay, this is this, and this is what you should do. <laughs> and then we do that. I, I feel like, I don't feel like it's, oh, then our, our, my opinion is, and my opinion is, I, I really feel like these are medical decisions. And I hope that we can get some firm uh, information from our doctors on Um I know I've had questions um, from people who are concerned about um, even if they get vaccinated, uh, they have family members living with them that are vulnerable and they know even vaccinated, they can still carry this virus. 
And so uh, they, I, I guess through the uh, individual contacts that we're gonna make, we'll, we'll discover those situations and we'll, we'll try and, and make accommodations for people who are in those situations because they're very fearful of, of carrying something to people that they have living with them at home. Sometimes it's uh, you know older parents who they may be vaccinated, but they are, they're still um, diabetic or, or it may be older people who couldn't be vaccinated for one reason or another. So, or it may be uh, babies at home. So um, I do know, um, I've gotten a lot of questions on that. And I think we all have, um, but uh, I'm gonna rely on our individual contact of these situations so that the accommodations can be made and hope we do that. And I will <laughs> say this, I agree with you. We, um, the good news is 70 year old plus are, are being vaccinated right now. Um, and I know that, so that, that is a positive, and that's not the only ones with, you know, special needs, I know that, but um, I believe by the time we make this recommendation that most 70 plus in our community will be vaccinated as well as a part of the 1B um, group. So that does help us with a great deal of those that uh, have had many of the significant side effects or deaths from COVID-19. Right. And one thing I do hope you said you mentioned it a while ago when we bring our kids back and our young kids, especially who aren't that, you know, school is still novel for them. Uh, when we bring them back, I hope that we spend some time and I've had several teachers mention this to me, uh, spend some time for them to get to know these kids, for them to just be get to just get used to being back in school and being together before we jump on trying to test them and test them and test them to see uh, where they are. I know those needs are there too, but uh, there is a tremendous need for these kids to, to reestablish this uh, school concept in, in their minds uh, for the younger ones, especially. And I know teachers are concerned about that. And I, I agree with you on that. And that's one of the reasons I'm an advocate for the last thing we need if we get our students back for 50 days in school, whatever that number would be, that we spend seven or eight doing standardized testing. Um, Absolutely. You know, that, that, that is not healthy for our students. They need every day to have social, emotional learning, mental health supports, re-engagement in school, um, and also you know, making sure we catch up on their learning. So uh, I will continue to advocate for that. Very good. Well, thank you. Next. Board Member Marshall. Thank you, Chair Porter. Uh, really quick comments. Uh, the first question is in regards to our ECE students. Uh, how are we preparing and uh, looking into what supports we can provide those teachers and those classrooms? Because I believe that comes with a special set of challenges in order to provide uh, accommodations to those students. So uh, in what ways are we preparing? It's a great question, Mr. Marshall. And we are obviously preparing to get our most vulnerable, especially ECE students back as quickly as possible and support them. But obviously as a part of recovery, ensuring that we get those for all of our students. I'll see if Kim Chevalier is available to bring any more context to that. Absolutely. We um, started, you know, at the beginning of this year, looking at the PPE equipment. So that extra PPE equipment will still be provided, uh, you know, with the vaccine. So, um, you know, and we'll have to look at the smaller classrooms, et cetera, as we've done before in the past. Um, but that has been sorted out. You know, we keep looking um, at what's available and what we can do. And most of our teachers, I will have to say, I'm very pleased and very blessed that they do want to come back and be with our kids. So it, that's exciting to me. Yeah, I agree. Most of the teachers that I'm talking to in ECE, they, they miss their kids. They miss, mm -hmm. you know, providing those accommodations. It's difficult through NTI, especially for, you know, our highest need uh, ECE population. Uh, but I, I think they are concerned about some challenges and just making sure that they're able to be effective in that instruction, but also feel safe at the same time. 
Absolutely. And we'll be checking on them regularly and, you know, any concerns that they have, um, we're ready. We're ready to, to give them what they need to support the teachers and, of course, our students. So, Okay. Yeah, that, that's good news. <laughs> um, and Dr. Polly, I guess my other question is, you know, I really uh, appreciate uh, the email that the board received from you, uh, particularly in regards to, you know, your statement about how we cannot return back to school uh, the same way that we left. And so can you expand a little bit more on that and just talk about what, what that really means, you know, from the top to say, you know, we're willing to do what it takes to make sure that when we return, that we return at the best that we are able to. Yeah, thank you. And I think, uh, Mr. Marshall, there's a short term and a long term that we have to look at. And I've heard everyone in the education field over the past 10 months say that, well, in many fields, that we won't return back to whatever profession that is the same way we left it. Uh, but all too often, people aren't talking about what that is. Um, and we've put together a work team that specifically is looking at what are those substantive changes we need to make. Now, short term is when we come back and let's say we have 40 or 50 days with students, whatever that number is, that our short term is to ensure that students don't face negative consequences because of the pandemic. So right away off the bat, our seniors, ensuring that our 12th graders get the supports they need, that we get them you know, meeting the standards, the benchmarks in order to get to graduation in a 50 or 60 day school year. Uh, and then moving on to all of our other students, you know, in every grade, ensuring that they get what they need to advance to the next grade. Like you said, ensuring our ECE students, we begin to mitigate, you know, that time lost um, in their IEPs and that we, we continue, you know, pick up those services for them. All of that is short term. And then long term changes, you know, we're really looking at several things. Um, I'll give two big examples of the changes we are looking to make. First of all, is using um, technology in a much better way than we've done before. And I think with our CARES II funding, um, we will be able to bridge that divide um, and kids can get supports for, for instance, if they miss school, um, they will be able to interact with their teacher uh, virtually at times throughout the day or after school. We can provide interventions for students. We can have conferences with parents where they don't necessarily have to be at the school. So really using that digital, that virtual platform to support kids in their learning. The second big thing we are looking at is how we modernize our grading. And so based on NTI, you know, um, I'm a believer in standards-based grading. Grades shouldn't be about compliant tasks and activities. It should be about whether students are proficient in the standards um, and their demonstration. It doesn't always have to be a test. That can be many different ways that you assess a, a child, um, but ensuring that they have authentic assessments, but that, they, that the, the assessments are truly assessing their ability as a student and that's what their grade reflects. Um, and so we think this is a real springboard, although I've been a proponent of standards-based grading for many years, this, this pandemic is a springboard to say, let's advance our grading beyond any other large district. So those are two examples, but we're looking at many others for long-term. Okay, and, and I appreciate that because I, I, I wholeheartedly agree that this is our opportunity uh, to throw away a lot of those things that have held a lot of students back uh, even held a lot of teachers back. They have great potential, but are definitely feeling confined uh, by some of the ways of the past that really aren't effective for students anymore. So, um, you know, I look forward to conversations around grading, uh, maybe even conversations around adjusting our school year calendar uh, in ways that are, you know, allow us to meet the needs of students, especially coming back from this pandemic. So uh, I appreciate that part and I will mute for now. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Board Member Marshall. Uh, uh, next, comments, questions? Board Member McIntosh. Sorry about that, thank you. Um, I'll be very brief because most of my questions were already asked by prior board members. Um, 
I, I just want to throw this out there as something to consider um, that even if it's not a matter of regulation, that as a matter of practice, when we talk about accommodations that we make toward um, for our pregnant teachers, our pregnant workers, that we also include our nursing mothers in with those same accommodations because their needs are going to be very similar. So I just want that to be um, considered. Um, and Dr. Pellio, if you can just clarify something, I think I understand what you're saying, but I just want to make sure. When you say that after we finish our first round of vaccinations, um, you'll come to us with a plan. I think some people are hearing that at that point, we're going to figure out how to come back to school. And I know that that plan already exists in, in a lot of detail. So the plan I think you're talking about is more of um, a, a return to in-person learning, more of like a schedule or that sort of thing. Could you maybe speak to that just a little bit more to clarify? Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, our schools and anyone can go to our website and see school plans and see that they are ready to go. What we are talking about that we would bring you would be specific uh, recommendations on dates. So we would say, okay, so if the final elementary school staff member, and I'm just throwing this out as an example, finished on February 28th um, and an X amount of days later, uh, we would um, have our setup days for our staff because once again, our setup, you know, our, our teachers have not had their setup day in their class. We want to get going as soon as possible, like get them in physically into the building. We would let you know what those days are. We would put a halt to NTI on those days so teachers could work. And that would probably just be one or two days. And then we would, so that we would bring you the calendar that said these would be these days. And then a recommendation if, if that happens on, you know, whatever date that is, let's say March 16th, let's just throw in that out there. Um, so it'd be specifics about employee work days, students return, and specifics about when families must make their decision about choosing virtual or in-person. Um, so those are what we were talking about and then specifically differentiated for middle school and high school. Uh, so the plans on actual how we return are already there these are more specifics, as you said, about dates. So once we get through with that first round um, and get some some very specifics about booster, knowing that what, when we're going to get it, how many doses, which we think we know now, but we just know things change, uh, that we can bring specific dates back to you at that time. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Chair Porter, that's all I have. Thank you. Dr. Shull, do you have anything? I think all of my questions have been previously answered. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have um, just one of the emails that I've received that I would like to ask questions from. And a lot of it has to do with the page where you talked about equity, accurate and timely communication and community trust, which was the first part of the presentation that you showed us. Um, it says that um, this is a question in the plan. It specifically states that there will be no capacity limit on buses. How is this allowed? And why is JCPS okay with ignoring the distancing guidelines when it comes to bus students' safety should be the top priority? Would you respond to that please, Dr. Polio? Yes, ma'am, we follow the state guidelines based on transportation. And so um, if you check the healthy at school guidelines, they make it very clear that students with masks um, as long as students have the masks on, um, that it doesn't have to be the very limited number of, of students on the bus. Um, and so we're just following state guidelines, essentially. Uh, Kevin, anything you want to add to that? No, that's that's correct. Um, the the uh, That was a debate uh, back when the Healthy at School guidance was being developed, and um, that was a compromise that was reached because uh, just of the logistics of getting kids to school, it was obvious that we had to have at least the ability on some buses to have full capacity um, or we would never be able to get, and I'm saying we, the whole state, that was an issue of getting students to school. And so public health uh, believe that since uh, bus rides are relatively short in duration, uh, as long as the masking was 
there as well as a, a, a attestation by parents by presenting their children they're going to be checking their temperatures every day and they would not put the student on the bus if there were any symptoms uh, then that uh, would be okay uh, the other downside is though if you do have to get into a contact tracing situation and you've had buses uh, you know with a full bus that does mean you, you know your contact tracing may have to go through those that were on the bus Okay, uh, thank you for both of those responses. I think the parent has a situation where her child goes to a depot and then um, changes buses and the email states that uh, there are normally three to a seat. So three to a seat would be accept acceptable if everyone has on a mask. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'll remind you of this, that as of now, 40% of our student population is still choosing the virtual. So we will have approximately 40% less students on buses as a result of the students that are remaining virtual. Uh, but Kevin, could you specifically answer that from the guidelines? I think the guidelines talk about bus capacity as, as being the capacity as long as the other guidelines are met. Um, and I think a bus capacity is, um, depending on the age of the child, um, you know, elementary children, there could be three to a seat, but I, I would defer to our experts in transportation on the actual capacity. Okay, well, I don't wanna drag it out, but um, I, I think if we can have uh, later more, um, more information perhaps, because um, I think the mother is aware of um, the, the she's, a, she's a parent, but she's also a teacher. So I'm just trying to bring some clarification to some questions that she has as it pertains to her children. Um, the next topic that she has in her email is about uh, consistency between schools. And she says, because she has her children in more than one school, she notices that the plans are different and some schools list things like dividers between desks while other schools do not do that. So the question is, how is that equitable for some students to be provided with more protection? Well, I'll just answer that. The, 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 the absolute minimum benchmark is that all schools meet the, meet the state guidelines, the healthy at school guidelines. Um, and that is in their plans. They've been checked by personnel to ensure that they're meeting the healthy at school guidelines. Um, and I do believe that um, all of our schools are doing that and doing, will do that effectively. Uh, but obviously schools have the ability to go above and beyond that and we'll support any school who needs additional assistance in that. Okay. Um, the next question deals with um, masks and when students don't have masks, what is the process for uh, notifying parents that uh, their child has been in a room perhaps where there is no mask or where there is a COVID, COVID positive person? What is the process? So um, I now let uh, Dr. Stone talk about contact tracing. First of all, we will have masks for every student. Um, we will have guidelines for students who don't wear masks and what the um, response of the school and the school district will be. Uh, but there will not be a um, any student who doesn't have a mask or doesn't have access to a mask. Dr. Stone, would you like to talk about the tracing part of it if there is a positive case? You're on mute. Story of my life. Um, we're in the process of implementing a, a new electronic health record that's going to allow us to better to monitor and track COVID cases. The classrooms will be set up in that system so that when we have a case and we need to notify parents, we'll be able to do so fairly quickly. Parents will have the option to sign up to get um, those messages via text or um, we'll also have contact tracing staff that will um, help reach out to families. And of course, we're doing that um, in conjunction with the health department. Um, they have a school-based contact tracing team will be supporting us in doing that work. Okay, thank you. And I have one last question and it's, uh, it pertains to um, communication to parents. And it says, I would just rather read it the way it was uh, typed or sent to me, 
uh, I feel that parents need to be made more aware of the changes in policies in a more direct and obvious manner. Many families will not seek out the return to school document and those that do not may not read or understand the document due to its length. A quick guide for parents should be created that hits the main components of the plan. So would you speak to that please, Dr. Polio? And that's the last, uh, last question that I have. Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion, but I'll turn it over to Renee Murphy, who can talk a little bit about what we're doing there. Good evening, Chair Porter. So we do have the information available on our website with our plan um, that details everything from transportation, what it's going to be like in classrooms. But one of the things that we are looking to develop when we get closer to returning to in-person instruction um, is more material um, on our website, more material on our apps, as well as information that will be mailed directly to families um, with, like you said, kind of a quick guide with all of the information uh, around some of the key points of the guidance for health and safety. Okay, thank you. That uh, I think completes the questions on back to school. So now we will turn Ms. to Porter, questions. I'm sorry, Chair Porter, would you, I, I have a, I forgot to ask a question and I have a follow-up point. Dr. Chris. Thank you. Um, I I appreciate on the, the school bus issue, I appreciate what we're saying about 40% of our people, our students, uh, you know, at this point are choosing virtual learning. But if we're talking about a situation where it's possible that there are going to be full or fairly full school buses transporting kids, you know, 20, 30, 35 minutes, I mean, that's just insane, frankly, in this uh, in this situation. I mean, that, you know, that I don't know if you've seen that Georgia Tech tool they have where it's like the you put in the number of people that are together and it tells you the the percent chance that at least one person in that group has is COVID positive. And right now for Louisville, in a group of 25 people, there's a 60% chance that at least one person in that group is COVID positive, which means that, you know, if we have 25 people on a school bus, one out of every two buses is going to have a COVID positive kid, you know, and then, you know, if we're lucky enough to find out about it, everybody on that bus has to quarantine for two weeks, I think is the CDC guidance. So, you know, that in particular, I think is, I, and we don't have to get into it as Chair Porter said right now, but I mean, that strikes me as particularly kind of crazy. I mean, I, that I appreciate, you know, what um, uh, Mr. Brown was saying about the logistics, but that's, you know, that's a way of saying like, look, there's really no way to do this safety safely. So just for convenience sake, you know, we're going to have to cut corners on safety. Um, and I, you know, I have res reservations about, uh, about doing that, frankly. Uh, but my, my question uh, was uh, related to the NTI learning hubs that we have right now. Are, um, are people that work in those learning hubs, even if they're not JCPS employees, are they eligible to get the vaccine in the K through 12 category timeframe? Uh, at this time, only those that are the substitute teachers that are, are working there. Uh, okay. So those that are community volunteers, not at this time. Okay. And I, let me say that's not our decision. No, I know. Yeah. I was just going to say, I appreciate there's nothing we can do about that, but um, you know, that's just for whoever's listening out there. I mean, that seems like they should qualify as a K through 12 educator if they're in a K through 12 education setting right now, even though it's unconventional. So, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before I call on you, uh, board member Craig, I just want to Dr. Polio to say one more time about substitute teachers because uh, I've gotten several emails about will substitute teachers qualify for the vaccine during the same uh, pattern that uh, we're calling our schools back. So would you uh, just quickly say substitute teachers and how they will be notified? Will they go alpha alphabetically by school or alphabetically by community hub? No, our substitute teachers will get a reservation time at the end of the elementary school. So once we get through all of our elementary schools, we will then have our subs go through um, with the intention that we have our subs ready when elementary school is ready. Um, so they will be getting an email if they reserve that vaccine um, that gives them the, the date and time for them to go to Broadbent Arena. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Craig, I think you had your hand up and if you're not gonna ask a question about back to school, then it's time for us to move on to uh, sports, but you can do whatever you need to ask first. 
I, I don't want to belabor the point and I just, but I want to make one final point. Um, I feel anxious about this point. Uh, I appreciate all the points for my colleagues, Dr. Cole, Ms. Duncan, Ms. Porter, um, all made wonderful points about buses and everybody made good points tonight. The concern that I have is that the rest of the world has moved heaven and earth to ensure that our teachers and our student facing employees receive this vaccine. If we are not prepared to send our children back into the classroom after they're vaccinated, I have significant concerns about um, that effort, about um, what we'll be saying to the rest of the world who has undertaken such a significant effort to get us vaccinated. Uh, I'm glad that we are getting vaccinated. I want us to proceed, uh, but I want us to keep that point in mind that Governor Bashir and the rest of the state isn't moving heaven and earth to make sure JCPS K through 12 teachers are getting vaccinated for us to continue in NTI. Uh, we have to be really honest with ourselves about that point going forward. Um, if we're not prepared to take the hard vote to go back to classes uh, after every one of our staff is vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to move on to sports? Because that's, that's our next topic. Uh, and uh, we'll start with you, if that's okay, Mr. Craig. Thank you, Chair Porter. Um, I shared my thoughts on uh, how we're approaching winter sports at the last meeting, um, and I am still of the same opinion tonight as I was then. I appreciate Dr. Polio's uh, comments tonight on where we stand with uh, winter sports. I appreciate his commitment to ensuring that all of our student athletes have safe access to transportation to participate in winter sports. Um, should the board uh, decide that we're going to proceed on that route. Um, I heard from him that he uh, is inclined to recommend an option where we begin practices tomorrow and competition on February 1st. Um, every decision that we're making this year is hard um, and none of these decisions are what we thought we would be doing when we ran for the Board of Ed way back when, except for Ms. McIntosh, who knew exactly what she was getting into <laughs> when she ran in the middle of COVID. Um, but I'm of the same mind that I was then. Um, and so I'd like to pose the question to the board again this evening. Um, and we'll move again, Ms. Porter, that we uh, proceed along with what Dr. Polio said earlier, um, that we begin practices tomorrow, competitions on February 1st. Um, and in support of that motion, uh, want to raise again the equity issues. Um, we have to acknowledge the fact that um, although our vote at the last meeting we felt was right, each of us individually must acknowledge that our students are the only students, uh, it seems in the state, uh, who are not able to participate in a winter sport uh, private school kids are doing it, Catholic school kids are doing it, private club kids are doing it, um, and I um, remain so, so frustrated that uh, we're asking them to sacrifice when no one else in the community is willing to make the same sacrifice, um, and we'll raise the point. Uh, I really appreciated an email that we all received today from Marion Vassar, the Executive Director of Diversity and Equity uh, at the University of Louisville who acknowledged the COVID concerns that we all have um, and that keep us all up at night. Um, but the equity director at the University of Louisville is imploring this board uh, to move forward with winter sports, acknowledging uh, that the sacrifice is only being felt by students who um, frankly just can't afford any more sacrifices. So um, I've made a long speech, I apologize for that, but my motion is, um, that we proceed with practices tomorrow in competition on February 1st. And I hope that someone will second it. Thank you. Well, wait, 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 wait. Before we get into this and have to pull something off, I'd like for us, if you don't mind, to have the discussion about sports. And then at that point, Dr. Polio will let us know whether there will be a motion only to accept the district response to the COVID-19 pandemic and at that point, we can add on the sports, if you don't mind. So that way we're not getting off track and everybody has had an opportunity to make their comment. There will be a vote 
but I, I don't want to accept a motion now only for sports when we're talking about back to school and sports, if you don't mind. Mr. Craig. That's not how I understood the agenda. And I thought my process was procedurally accurate, but I'm happy to proceed as you've recommended, Chair Porter. Okay, I will I will um, say what, what I have in my notes about this evening. And it says, uh, will there be a motion to receive an update regarding the district response to COVID-19 pandemic and approve the start of winter sports practices on January 20th with uh, games beginning on February 1. That's what I have in my notes for this evening. So uh, I didn't have your notes. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, and if I am mis misquoting or misstepping, uh, Kevin Brown, would you stop me now, please? Uh, I think I think we're all saying the same thing. Uh, it's just a timing issue. Um, if Mr. Craig wants to withdraw his motion now, um, I think we could proceed on his motion now, but if he wants to withdraw it to have additional conversation, I think there's two motions ahead of us. This board has a tradition of accepting reports. And so um, there would be a need to be a motion to accept this report. By accepting the report, it would not say yay or nay on the athletic uh, matter because the athletic matter is just an option presented in the report. After that, um, it would be appropriate to continue to entertain a motion on athletics since that still is an outstanding question. And Mr. Craig could pose the motion at that point if you want to proceed in that way. Um, okay. And so I will draw the motion now. I, I, did, I don't have your notes and I don't see anything in the agenda, which is like what you said, Chair Porter, which is why I made the motion when I did. Uh, but I am happily withdrawing it now and we can come back to it at the end of the discussion. Okay, and um, I just have notes that you don't happen to have based on what what the motion may look like. So um, not that I'm, I'm keeping it a secret, I'm just sharing it as it was given to me, if that's okay. So uh, you said your comments about sports and if there are any other comments about sports, then I would like to hear those now and then we will move forward if there are no objections from the board. Any other comments about sports this evening? Uh, Dr. Kolb and um, who wants to go after Dr. Kolb? Uh, Dr. Shul. Okay, Dr. Kolb first. Thank you. And I actually sent um, Amy Dennis a few slides that I put together. Uh, if she wouldn't mind throwing those up right now, that'd be great. Uh, this is not a hundred slide presentation, I promise, James. It's uh, more like 20. So uh, go ahead and go to the, th so this is, some stuff that I've collected about sports and it, it gets a little bit larger than sports um, just to connect the issues together, uh, but uh, but it's, it's mostly about where we are sports. So this is the, the current context we're in, as you might know that US uh, is having its in its deadliest period uh, for COVID right now. Uh, and these are some quotes from Dr. Fauci, I believe that people have just gotten used to the fact that thousands of people will die. Uh, I don't think that's a good thing for us to get used to. Um, and as he says down at the bottom of the slide, now is not the time to pull back on this. Uh, and again, that's Dr. Anthony Fauci. Next slide, please. And this is the local context uh, from last week in the Courier. Cases are at an all-time high. We broke the death record last week. Uh, Sarah Moyer says we've entered another surge. We're in triple red category, uh, Dr. Moyer says. Next slide, please. Uh, and then this is uh, a summation of where we are in Jefferson County, daily new cases average, that positivity test rate, almost 15%. Next slide, please. And then this is a comparison about where we were in August 20, on August 24th, when we made the decision about fall sports, which are largely outdoor. Uh, so this is what the map of Louisville looked like, uh, incidence map of COVID at the time we made that decision about uh, fall sports. Next slide, please. And then this is the map right now when we're deciding about winter sports, uh, which are mostly indoors or, or all indoors. Uh, uh, I don't know which. So you see there's quite a quite a difference. We're in quite a bit uh, worse territory. Next slide, please. So back on August 24th, we were looking at 14.2 uh, uh, new cases per day. Uh, next slide, please. And now we're at uh, 65.2 new cases per day. Um, so again, indoor sports, uh, the cases are quadruple what they were uh, back in August when we were talking about outdoor sports. Next slide, please. 
Uh, and then this is the another comparison. Uh, so total number of cases over the previous seven days back on August 24th, 185.6. Uh, next slide, please. And then now we're at uh, 500 uh, new cases per seven days uh, per 100,000. Uh, so again, quite an increase. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so these are the recommendations that are uh, what Je for Je for Kentucky, but Jefferson County included for what we should be doing. And I, I put boxes around the ones that particularly relate to winter sports. Masks should be mandated and worn by everyone outside their home. You know, I don't think that our athletes are going to be wearing masks while they're competing. Gyms should be avoided and required to close. You know, that's pretty analogous to sports activities. Gathering should be avoided with people outside the immediate household. Obviously, sports require gatherings outside the immediate household. Next slide. So these are these are general school indicators. These are not sports specific. We'll get to those in just a second, but I thought it was worth looking at. So this is straight from the CDC website, and you see that in the core indicators, Jefferson County is way in the red. So uh, this figure above 200, uh, we're at 930. Uh, this figure above 10%, we're at 14.9% as of today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this top one is still TBD. That's the ability of our schools to, to make accommodations. And then on the secondary indicators, uh, the, the rate of COVID is growing in the, in the community. So it's accelerating still up until a few days ago, that is. Uh, you see that thankfully, the one good thing is that our hospitals have capacity. So that's good. Uh, next slide. And then um, localized community setting outbreak. Again, this triple red figure uh, that we're in. So on the school indicators, on every, you know, just about every meaningful school indicator, we are not only in the extreme category, but we are way in the extreme category. Uh, next slide. So these are sports sp specific, and this is the website that it comes from, CDC website. You can go and find this page. Uh, next slide. So here's the things that we should consider according to uh, the CDC. Community, community levels of COVID-19, are they high? Yes, they're high. Physical closeness of players. Uh, all or most of our indoor, uh, of our winter sports require extreme physical proximity. Uh, level of intensity of activity. Most of our sports in the winter, all of them probably basketball, wrestling, are very intense, uh, require very intense activity. Uh, next slide. Length of time that players are close to each other. Uh, they're gonna be close to each other quite a bit, uh, especially in things like basketball. Setting of the activity or sport. Indoor activities pose more risks. They're indoor activities. Next slide. Amount of necessary touching of shared equipment and gear. Obviously, lot, lots of that going on. Players at higher risk of de developing severe illness. Uh, one of the categories is asthma. And as you know, uh, next slide please. Uh, Louisville is a terrible city for asthma. So many of our students have asthma. We're the seventh worst city in the country for asthma. So, you know, we're going to be putting those kids at risk uh, uh, if they engage in. Um, that's something that Louisville does not have in common with a lot of the rest of the state. Next slide, please. Um, and then we know that myocarditis is still an issue. How big of an issue, you know, is not yet clear, but it, but it, it you know, it, it is definitely an issue. Um, uh, next slide. And then this is from Dr. Stack's testimony back in August uh, about myocarditis. You know, if if it's suspected that a, that a kid might have it, it requires lots of expensive testing, electrocardiogram, blood draws, echocardiogram. As Dr. Stack asked, how many parents can really afford that? Next slide, please. Uh, and then this is from the uh, Louisville um, uh, uh, Public Health uh, Department of Public Health website. Uh, speaking to the equity issue, black community, other communities of color are more heavily burdened by chronic illness and these chronic illnesses make it more likely that you're going to experience severe COVID-19 complications that lead to higher death rates. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, by way of wrapping up, uh, there are many things about COVID that we just don't know yet, including, uh, but there's some, some, some evidence that uh, it can create neurological permanent or long-term, if not permanent, neurological damage, uh, similar to the, the flu in 1918 and SARS and MERS recently. Uh, strokes have been a symptom of patients of, of all ages, not just older ones. Next slide, please. 
Um, and then this is uh, a very recent study that came out of the Children's uh, uh, Hospital of Philadelphia that ev uh, all children they found have blood vessel damage from COVID, even if they had absolutely no COVID symptoms. Again, we don't know the long-term implications of this, but it's something that these researchers found very concerning. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then, you know, this is what it really comes down to with sports. I mean, I appreciate that, you know, we're going to do all kinds of um, temperature checks and all that sort of stuff, but 60% of COVID cases are spread asymptomatically. You know, people that don't have temperatures, there's no way to detect, you know, short of a COVID test if they have it or not. And we're not COVID testing everybody. So there's just, you know, we're essentially saying 60% of the COVID cases uh, are going to get through our screening process because there's no symptoms attached to it. Next slide, please. Uh, oh, and this, this is just reiterating the sports considerations that that um, that the CDC put out there. So thank you, Ms. Dennis. You can escape out of that, uh, escape out of that now. So, um, you know, clearly you can tell where I'm coming down on this and it's not just because, you know, trust me, I want kids playing sports, but um, the science just doesn't support it, uh, I think is was uh, pretty evident in that um, I think you know, we're a few things we're getting sucked into a little bit of the boiled frog mentality, you know, where if you keep raising the temperature, the frog doesn't, you know, uh, realize it until until it's boiled. Um, you know, we've just kind of gotten used to this situation, uh, unfortunately, where thousands of people are dying every day and community transmission is really out of control. And, and, and it's something I think we should not really be getting used to. And then you know, I appreciate uh, what folks are saying about other p decisions that other people are making, and our kids, unfortunately, are the only ones that are being asked to sacrifice. But, you know, I many of you probably had a similar experience as me when I was a child. You know, my mother said to me about a billion times, you know, if your friend jumped off a bridge, would you jump off it too? And I, I mean, that's exactly what this is. I mean, we can't say that we're going to make the decision based upon bad decisions that other districts are making, you know, that they're making bad decisions. I mean, that's the reality of it, given the science. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not going to follow what some, you know, good old boy out in Kentucky wants to do for for kids in, in some some county out in Kentucky, um, just because, you know, they're they're willing to take risks because of politics or whatever that that are not worth taking. Um, you know, to me, this is very um I, I honestly don't even understand why we're considering um, going forward with sports. It's not safe for our community. Um, you know, we're going to be adding to the death toll if we go forward with this. I mean, there's just no question about that. Um, so if we want to go forward with it, you know, if you want to vote in the affirmative, that's fine. But but please don't be under any illusions about what you're voting to go forward with. Uh, you are voting to go forward with more suffering, more death in our community, more sickness, a longer term uh, 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 outbreak in the community before we can get this thing under control. So, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Uh, Cope, thank you. And um, thank you for the information that you have provided, but I want to apologize to the board because it is our process that we receive the information for our board meetings prior to the meeting night. So thank you for your presentation, but in fairness to the board, it would have been more helpful, I think, if we had had an opportunity to see this if it was no more than earlier today. So um, there were multiple slides and I understand your presentation, but as the chair of the board, I have to say that we have a process where the board has pushed for the 10 years that I've been on the board to see everything prior to the board meeting. So thank you, and, and we will move forward uh, with Dr. Shul, and then we will come back and decide how we will want to vote. So and I, I appreciate that. I finished that at six o'clock, six o'clock tonight. So sorry, I wasn't able to get it. Well, uh, again, uh, in the chair that I'm sitting in, I, I have to be fair to everybody on the board. So, uh, Dr. Shul, if you have some comments, please. Thank you, Chair Porter. Uh, I think me and Dr. Cole had the same mother. Uh, my mother always said to me at, at least three times a week, if your friends jump off a bridge, does that mean you're going to jump off the bridge as well? I'm deeply troubled by um, the reticence and the push to, to do athletics 
in a moment where this pandemic is raging and is claiming the lives of so many people. Uh, as we have been on this board meeting, there has also been a memorial to the 400,000 people who have died as a consequence of COVID. And um, I think that's very serious. And so I just want to register um, that reality as we talk about playing sports in the midst of a pandemic. I've received emails uh, that have, have been deeply moving to me. And uh, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the well-being of our students, our staff, our city. Uh, in the context of playing sports, but I've heard overwhelmingly from coaches that they believe they can do it. Um, I, I also, though, I'm concerned about what happened during the fall with students who had contracted COVID and as a consequence of contracting COVID had to report it and their teams were pulled out of um, athletic contests, so some of the um, championship games or, or whatever uh, those, those games are labeled as, and what that also does to students. Uh, so I, I think we have a huge issue here, and I, I, I almost think it's unfair to even be put in this position to have to make these kind of decisions in the midst of a medical health crisis that we know has been mismanaged federally, and yet we continue um, to be put in this position. So I just want to register that. Uh, I don't have any questions, but but I, I, this is serious. And so many of our students and our faculty and our staff have dealt with uh, deaths as a consequence of it. And it just seems sort of inhumane um, to continue to go on uh, uh, with this in this climate. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shul. Um, I, I want to, um, say a couple of things. First of all, that we have received a lot of um, emails about sports and I have tried to ask parents to talk about what specific sport and the response that I have gotten back is basketball is the majority that the people are talking about, but I know that we're talking about all uh, winter sports. I am um, very concerned about um, as we talk about sports, how that impacts the mental health of the students that we are being asked to give them the opportunity to come out and do something other than be um, tied to uh, the NTI work. I also feel that if we move forward with sports, it is the responsibility is not only on the district, the responsibility is on the parent because we have um, procedures in place and in the um, email that we received, the board received from um, Mary Ambassador from the University of Louisville, she says the JCPS has an opportunity to set guidelines that are safe with limited crowds if necessary, if athletes are required to wear their masks on the bench and limit shared transportation as much as possible, we can likely do this safely. Safe, safely, but her biggest comment was, I am seriously concerned about the mental health of our children, particularly the ch students who experience sports as a lifetime, lifeline in many ways. Uh, many of them have complied with rules, they have quarantined, they have masked up, they are literally stressed about the vote tomorrow. I worry as they are losing hope and motivation daily and will eventually start gathering on their own and putting themselves in a, at a greater risk. So I, I just want to share that uh, as, I, and I think everybody received that email. So I think according to what I have heard, Dr. Polio, and you can confirm this, I think that there needs to be two votes. And the first vote will be on moving forward with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And then the second vote needs to be on moving forward on the sports so that we have two motions and two opportunities to vote, to vote, or if you prefer, you we will do the, the, um, the way it was printed first in the agenda. So would you give me some guidance so I know how to move forward, please? Uh, yes, ma'am. I believe what is, and I'll defer to, to Kevin on this, but I believe you would make a vote to accept the um, presentation that we gave. And then if there is a motion, a second motion to move forward on the athletics vote. Is that correct, Kevin? That's correct. The, the, 
the report is obviously just the update that you've been discussing. By accepting the report, it makes no decisions uh, on athletics or anything else other than that you're accepting the information we gave you. Okay, is there a motion at this time to approve the update on district response to COVID-19 pandemic? Is there a motion, please? So move. I'm sorry, I say that again. Who said that? You know, Shaw did, Reverend okay, Shaw. Okay, Dr. Shaw, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm not good at looking down and looking up at the same time. I apologize. Who would like to second that motion? Craig did. Oh, uh, board member Craig, thank you. I will now call for the vote on that particular motion about accepting the report that we have received, uh, starting with uh, board member McIntosh. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shull. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Duncan. Yes. Thank you. Board member Marshall. Yes. Thank you. Board member Craig. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chris. Yes. Thank you, Diane Porter. Yes, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. So now is there a motion of- uh, Chair Porter. I'm sorry. Can I uh, raise my comments on the sports discussion? I have not had a chance to speak on this. Is that- oh, I'm sorry. Right? Yeah, me too. There's a, if there's a motion, we, we anticipate a motion on athletics coming next. And then if there, that receives a second, then there will be, uh, there'll be ample time uh, for any discussion of that motion on the athletics. So I think that'd be the best way to go. Okay, so we'll take the motion first in a second and then a uh, board member Marshall, you'll be the first to speak. And then I heard Ms. Duncan say she wanted to speak also. Is, yes. Are you comfortable with that, Mr. Yes, Marshall? Yes, ma'am. Okay, is there a motion please um, on the uh, winter sports? Is there a motion? Craig moves. Okay, motion by Mr. Craig and seconded by Marshall. Mr. Marshall, and so now we will go with discussion. We could restate the, just for the record and the public, we could just restate that motion, Board Member Craig. Uh, I had moved to adopt um, the comments from Dr. Polio in his presentation that the district proceed with winter sport practices beginning January 20th and competition on February 1st. I have a question about that motion. It wasn't clear to me from the presentation that that's what Dr. Polio was recommending. It just said in the presentation that it was an option that that was being put forward. Um, I, I don't think that's a accurate wording of the motion unless we hear differently. The motion stands. Well, so Dr. Po Dr. Polio, are you recommending that we start practice tomorrow and uh, as the option, uh, are you recommending that option? I was recommending that option, yes. Okay, so we have a motion, we have a second and the discussion will start with board member Marshall. Thank you, Chair Porter. You know, once again, we uh, reiterate the point uh, that none of us thought we'd be sitting in these seats making these type of decisions. Um, I think all of us, from the information we've received and those who have done our due diligence, understand you know, how serious this pandemic is. Uh, but I do agree with a point that Dr. Scholl has made that it does feel like a slight to us to be sitting here having to make this decision. Uh, Dr. Cobb, I wish you could have sat in front of KHSAA and made that same presentation and told them. It, it made no sense to continue, but here we sit to make this choice and this decision. If we say no, the idea that these students are simply gonna sit at home and not go places is uh, kind of ignorant on our part. Kids are already moving around. A lot of these kids are already attending camps. I have a student who attends my uh, virtual class every day from basketball camp. So they're already around others. The reason why our numbers have gone up, uh, the society is moving more, more moving parts are around. And so our small percentage of students being the only ones not moving. Uh, yes, I do agree. Uh, you know, if that keeps one person from having severe COVID, yeah, we, we could count that a win. Uh, but it also raises the point where a lot of others are making 
uh, the mental health and stability of our students, and eventually uh, trying to get back into buildings. Uh, there's got to be a path forward. And so, you know, for me, that that's, I stand the same place I was last time. I think that we can uh, have the right uh, limitations on crowd sizes. We can implement things uh, that allow these students to do this safely. Um, but there is risk, just like there's risk with a lot of things that we don't foresee. And so uh, it does come down to, you know, uh, how each parent is going to run their household. Uh, but I think it is our job to do what's best for students. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I think that it is a tough decision, but uh, it, it's one that, you know, here we are and we have to. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Board Member Marshall. Ms. Duncan, you are next, and then we'll see who, if anyone wants to speak after that. Okay, Board Member McIntosh wants to speak after that. So Ms. Duncan first, and then Board right. Member McIntosh. Okay, I, I have said this in several of my emails that uh, the school boards should not be making medical decisions. Uh, this is a medical decision that was handed to us as then a political decision. And as a political decision, it's very difficult then to tune out the voices of the parents who are wanting to assume this risk, even though it's not just about their kids, the risk is not just to their kids, it's also to everybody who is involved in the, in the whole competition and practice process. So um, it becomes very difficult to tune out those, those, those voices I mean, from coaches and athletic directors and principals, uh, it's very difficult to stand there and say, no, no, I, I know better. I'm not the medical doctor. I think the medical community should be the one telling us what we should be doing and shouldn't be doing in terms of this. And I'm very disappointed that we don't have that kind of uh, guidance coming at us. We should not be sitting here making these medical decisions. But um, I, I have thought a lot about this and I've listened to the majority of the people who have contacted me and who have insisted that they want this responsibility. They want to try this with their kids. They know it may not work. They know there may be some downsides here and you know, I, I've talked about uh, how many games do we really think we're going to be able to play. I see COVID showing up on every team. So, I mean, I'm just, but I feel like as, a, as this political issue was handed to us, we must be aware of our, our constituents out there and what they're wanting. Uh, I can't tune it out. So um, I'm, very reluctantly um, supporting this recommendation with the hope that we can limit crowds and that we can do everything we can in our power to keep kids as safe as we can. We can't keep them safe, but we can keep them as safe as we can so that our kids um, are able to, to compete and have the season that they can have, um, even though it won't be a pretty season. So um, I, I have decided in that direction. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. Uh, board member McIntosh. Honestly, a lot of what I wanted to say has already been expressed, but you know, there's, there's probably not a right decision um, when you come down to all of the varying factors. Are we going to make mistakes? Probably so, um, but throughout, my career, what I hope I do is ask myself, what's best for kids? And I think ultimately what's best for kids is giving them tools to cope with this, this world that they're living in that most of them are not necessarily equipped. Most adults are not equipped to cope with the world that they are having to live in. And so I think, um, we can't underestimate the value 
um, of the life lessons and, and teamwork and character building that sports provide to our young people. And honestly, if anything is going to help a lot of our students' mental health and help them with their coping um, through this entire situation, it's going to be their teammates, their coach, engaging in something that they feel passionate about. And so um, if I'm going to make an error in judgment, I'm going to make an in, in what I personally think is best for kids. So that's why I would support them being able to play. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we've heard from every board member. Was there anything else that you wanted to say, Mr. Craig? I think you said you had you were comfortable with what you had said last time, but do you have any other remarks before I call for the vote? I'll hold my tongue, Ms. Porter. No further comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So at this time, we do Ms. have Porter, a motion. Can I follow up real, just real quick? Yes, sir, Dr. Cole. Thank you. You know. Either we believe in the science or we don't. I mean, that's what it comes down to. You know, I, I haven't seen anybody else present any facts, any science, you know, anything of that nature. I, I mean, so are we are going forward, you know, with other decisions, are we not going to look at facts and evidence? Um, because that's the precedent that we're setting uh, if we don't if we don't do so, uh, if we don't do so now, you know, it it. If you go, if you vote for this, you just can't say that you believe the COVID-19 science. I mean, you're, you're almost worse than the COVID-19 deniers because you're saying, no, I believe in the science, but nonetheless, I'm still going to, to do this thing that contradicts the science. You know, it's not going to be good for kids if their parents or grandparents and aunts and uncles die because they transmit COVID to them. And the kid has to wonder, you know, did my family member die because I gave them COVID? It's not gonna be good for kids if they have heart damage, if they have blood vessel damage, you know, if they have neurological damage. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not very often that you take a vote that you know is gonna save lives, um, but that's the position we're in. This is what I wanna conclude by sharing a quote from Dr. Stack. As we allow more activity to happen, there is more disease. As there is more disease, there is more death. So we know this will happen. Dr. Stack, the state's leading person on COVID says, if we allow more activity, more people are gonna die. So that's the vote we're taking here tonight. Chair Porter. Board Member Craig. I appreciate your passion, Dr. Kolb. It's one of the things I respect the most about you. You must understand that the yes votes tonight are not folks who are voting because they want children to die or they want family members to die. And you know it's better to think <laughs> than to say that we're ignoring science or that we're ignoring reality. The reality that we see is that there's nobody else in the world willing to make the sacrifice that to date we have made for our children. So we can vote tonight to eliminate an option for winter sports if we think it's in our children's best health, but it's not going to eliminate that risk. These children, as, Dr. as Mr. Marshall said, they're still going to be out in the community. They're still going to be mingling with each other. The JCPS board standing alone has not been able to curb the spread of COVID-19 in the community. And it's clear to me that this vote will do nothing to, to curb the spread amongst our students. It's not fair for these poor students, our most disenfranchised students, to be the only ones shouldering this burden when it's clear to me at least, and I think to most people that this vote alone is not going to do anything to curb the spread of COVID-19 in the community. I want us to still so the spread of this that's, that's not true based We're on the science. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> board member there Craig, are several unsubstantiated I'm sorry, board claims member Craig has the floor at this time. He has not finished his comments. We gave you your opportunity to have your comments. I want to be fair to every board member. And when board member Craig finishes, you can make some remarks. But the other thing I want to say, it's okay to disagree how we disagree together collectively as a board and how we present ourselves to the community matters. So board member Craig, you can finish. Dr. Kolb, you can make some remarks and then I'm calling for the vote because this could go on for the next hour and there's no reason for it to. Board member Craig, are you finished? 
I'll just say these are very tense times. Uh, I do respect uh, all six of you um, and Dr. Polio, this team of eight that we have together. We're all making very difficult decisions under very difficult circumstances. I know that everybody's going to vote tonight uh, with the best of intentions for their students and their community. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Dr. Cole. I, I just wanted, I mean, there's just, there were just several unsubstantiated claims that Member Craig made without any support in, in fact. Um, so, I mean, frankly, I just think that people that are voting for this are just caving to community pressure, uh, you know, one way or the other, because everybody else is doing it, we feel like we have to do it. And, you know, I, I just think that's a terrible example to set for, for, uh, for. Okay, at this time, I will call for the vote. I won't repeat Dr. C uh, Board Member Craig's words exactly, but uh, what we're voting for is for uh, to approve the start of winter sports practices on January the 20th with the games beginning on February 1. So if have I missed anything, uh, Board Member Craig? No, ma'am. Okay, so at this time, I, I am calling for the vote and I would like to start with uh, Board Member McIntosh. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Shule. No, ma'am. Okay, uh, Board Member Duncan. Yes. Thank you, uh, Board Member Marshall. Yes. Thank you, Board Member Craig. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chris. No. Diane Porter is a yes for students. So we have we have five yeses and two noes this evening. The motion passes. Thank you. We will now move on to the information items. And the first information item is the acceptance of the report on the KDE management audit, audit findings and continuous improvement strategies. Dr. Polio. Thank you, Chair Porter. And we will be brief on the audit findings and next steps. We did want to present to you the next steps as I did in the superintendent report in um, December, report to you some of the audit findings. Uh, but once again, I do want to take this first opportunity to thank everyone in JCPS who worked so hard over the past two years to meet the needs, uh, those deficiencies that were found uh, nearly four years ago now, um, the 276 deficiencies. This has been nonstop work since that time with so many people um, invested in ensuring that we um, improve in the way we do things. So uh, as you know, September 21st to October 9th, in the middle of K uh, NTI and the pandemic, we had the three week review with KDE. They conducted 1,558 interviews and also re re reviewed hundreds, probably thousands of documents of evidence, personnel records, uh, education records and so forth. So inspected buses, um, it was a, an exhaustive review. So anyone who thinks that that wasn't a full review obviously needs to see this data when they take a look at it. Uh, the most important finding obviously is that they found, KDE found there is not a pattern, a significant lack of efficiency and effectiveness in the governance and administration of JCPS. So we were very proud to see that. And most importantly, that we had neither state management nor state assistance being necessary. So extremely proud uh, of that work. And I don't know if three years ago, we would have seen that we would be out of state management or state assistance. And then finally, that the settlement agreement that this board agreed to uh, two and a half years ago, uh, that settlement agreement is now considered fulfilled. So we are proud of that. And so in the management of some of the significant improvements that they found really around CTE, finance, professional development opportunities, we heard a lot. Um, anecdotally about the vision of the district and how there is uh, now more about a school district and less a district of schools, which we were proud of. Um, and just a lot of positivity about how much we had improved over the past two and a half, three years. Improvement areas still exist. We know in special education, clearly that is um, an area that we must continue to work with KDE and uh, continue to grow and improve. We are doing that. It was probably the deepest hole. It definitely was the deepest hole we were in. Uh, we will continue to do that, but I'm confident we will continue that improvement. And then also some issues around safe crisis management, but I will say we are still considered a leader in this in the state, uh, but with the number of students we have and many times the issues we have, including special schools, 
Um, this is something we'll continue to work on in safe crisis management. Recommendations, some of the recommendations they gave us for improvement that I just wanted to highlight. I don't wanna make it you know, all positive. These are still things we have to improve on. You know, a progress monitoring system to close achievement gaps. We know that achievement gaps still exist um, and we have a long way to go and, and the pandemic will only increase that, but we will continue to work on that. Having quality control checks throughout the district. Um, we'll continue to do those. Having individualized professional learning. So I think there was a lot of um, discussion in there about ongoing individualized professional learning. We feel like our professional development for staff has improved, but this is something that we must continue to work on. Obviously the number of behavior referrals and the disproportionality of behavior referrals, this is nothing new uh, to us or to this board. And it's something that we have to be invested in and continue to work hard. Um, interestingly enough, I wanted to highlight the fifth bullet here, which in this audit once again, said we were not taking advantage of every single revenue opportunity we had and specifically pointed to the utility tax. So this came after we, this board had voted to increase um, above the 4%, but still we were recognized by KDE by not taking every single uh, opportunity for additional revenue. And once again, they specifically pointed out the utility tax. Uh, so for the second time in an audit, we have essentially been dinged because we are not taking every ad, um, avenue for additional revenue for our students. But I am proud that we stood up and took it uh, above the 4% this time. And then continue to have you know, communication, breaking down silos and connections between initiatives are extremely important. Um, our next steps, uh, review the findings and recommendations. We have been doing that and incorporate them into our improvement practices. We have done that. Um, so we're very, you know, this is becoming a part of our regular work. And then obviously we have to collaborate with KDE to ensure that we meet the expectations under IDEA, which is all of our special education students. And so this is really how we are doing it. We have, we, we looked at those items that we think are those high impact and high risk and we found 42 cap items that we call cabinet reviews. Um, and those are those high risk, high impact things um, that we know we must continue to focus on on a regular basis. We're having cross department collaborations with those and we will have regular opportunities like we have done over the past two years to have reviews at the cabinet level. Uh, the experts in our district will bring us how we are doing, show us data on how we were doing. And so we can still monitor those 42 high risk, high impact strategies. And then we will have 28 other items that are monitoring reports uh, that we will monitor on a regular basis. Um, we will have reports uh, that will be done by those divisions, uh, but they will be less those high risk, high impact strategies. We will continue to monitor those and make adjustments as needed, uh, but we will make sure in all of these items that we are on top of the ones that we know um, have a bit have more of a risk and a higher impact. We will continue to monitor these. We're taking a look at all of our future state and cabinet, but not turning away from these items as we want to ensure fidelity and implementation and improvement across all of these areas. That concludes um, our presentation. Once again, very thankful that we can now move past this chapter in JCPS and look towards the future of how we'll continue to improve systems um, and processes within our district. Happy to take any questions or feedback that you have. I'd like to start with questions first in the interest of time, if uh, no one minds that. So we, as we move forward, uh, uh, are there any questions from board members about the information, <clears throat> excuse me, that you have just received? Any questions? No questions. Uh, board member Craig. I guess, Dr. Polio, if you can let us know how we'll be able to track the recommendations for ongoing improvement in the future. Um, I'm not sure if this draws an end to our routine uh, cap updates. Um, will we be able to you know, give us an idea of how we can track this? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And we have a couple of options. I think we could um, include them in our quarterly reports that we bring to you that has that vital sign check, the data, um, that we could do that, or we could do a more uh, complete 
you know, every six month report to you about those high risk, um, you know, um, high impact cabinet review ones, if that's what you would choose. We're open to either one, but we would like to continue to make sure you are updated on those. And uh, as one board member would defer to you on the best way to bring it to us, but to ensure that it does get in front of us um, on an ongoing basis to help us track this. And again, I said it earlier, but it, it was in a different session. The district, the administration receive, deserves significant praise for getting us to this point um, while also being able to juggle everything else, COVID-19 revenue, new school buildings, et cetera. Uh, so congratulations one more time to you and your team. Thank you, sir. Other questions about the report? Uh, Ms. Duncan? I don't have a question, but um, like Mr. Craig, these recommendations are, I think, very important for us to keep in mind. And if we can, you know, just break it into parts periodically and hear how we're doing in those areas. I think that would that would be very helpful to us. Um, these are, especially in the area of IDEA, we had such a uh, such a challenge there, and and it spilled over into the discipline challenge of uh, reducing referrals and how do we get in front of behaviors before those things happen that we don't have choices about. So um, I, I do uh, I do think that it would be great to have that broken into parts and then periodically those things brought to us, but not, not overwhelming us with everything at once, but just kind of focusing on different areas and, and letting us know how we're doing. Thank Let's you. Do. Thank you. Other questions? I have a question, Dr. Polio, about the ECE issue and the concern about uh, Ms. Duncan has, has talked about the IDE funding. If we don't get that right, uh, we stand to lose funding for the district and we have worked very hard with the staff that we have on hand, but there is a, a backlog of students that need to be assessed and that there need to be uh, meetings with parents so that they are aware of what the assessment says. And I know that I'm speaking as a board member who responded to a parent that reached out to me. Is there a potential for this board to, uh, for this district to hire uh, retired uh, folks that can give assessments so that we can get, to, so we do not have students waiting a year before they can be assessed and an opportunity for them to have the uh, meeting so they are aware of the results. And if we don't have the funding within JCPS, is that funding that can come out of the federal dollars that are coming to support um, students in the districts? That's my question. Yes, ma'am. Um, we will have that funding to do that. And I know I keep saying the CARES too, that's not officially what it's called. Um, but that funding can go to anything um, that um, the district has had to suffer, so to speak, students caused by COVID. And that would be one of those. Um, so yes, um, we have the ability to do that. And we're putting a plan together to fast track as many as we possibly can on the assessment and the intervention side of it. I do want to say our biggest threat to funding with IDEA um, comes from disproportionality in discipline um, outcomes. And so although that is a part of our racial equity plan and should be, um, that is a part of our IDEA corrective action plans at the federal level. Um, and once again, that is our biggest threat to funding if we do not correct that disproportionality in discipline outcomes um, and so I just, I know that wasn't your question, but I wanted to throw that in there. But yes, we, we do have the funding to address that. Okay, Dr. Poliel, since you brought that up, um, I would like for you to bring back to the board what, what the uh, process is and what the recommendation is to work on the other aspect of the correction plan that you just spoke of, the behavior and all of that. And uh, I was not really speaking about the money. I was speaking about how we're taking care of the needs of our students as quickly as possible. So what I heard your response say is that there's, you're working on the backlog to get students assessed and to get parents informed because it is, um, whether there's IDA, EA or not, it is not our best work to wait parents wait for a year before their, their child can be assessed. And I understand that we're in a pandemic. I got that. But 
we're not going to be in there forever and we have testing sites available so i would really urge us uh to do that if we don't have and what i heard you say is we don't have the money within the district to hire additional people that can do the assessments is is that correct dr polio no i said the opposite of that Ms. porter i'm sorry that um, using this new funding, we will be able to address ECE needs, both with assessment uh, and with compensatory education. So this funding will be available for that. Okay, so we're going to use the new federal dollars to take care of that, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Dr. Shul, did you have something? I saw you raise your hand, I thought. I'm sorry. Are, no. there, are there comments now before, we, before I call for the vote on uh, the uh, management audit findings? that uh, the report that has been given to us tonight, are there other comments from board members, please? Is there a motion at this time to receive the report on the KDE management audit findings and continuous improvement strategies? Is there a motion? Craig. Board member Craig, seconded by board member Duncan. I will call for the vote, please, starting with uh, Dr. Chris. Yes. Thank you, board member Craig. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, board member Marshall. Yes. Thank you, board member Duncan. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Shule. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, board member McIntosh. Yes. Thank you, board member Porter. Yes, it's unanimous. Thank you very much. The next item under information items is the acceptance of the general fund draft budget for the fiscal year to 2021-22. Uh, Dr. Polio, I will ask you to introduce uh, this report to the board, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chair Porter and board members. This is the draft budget, um, which as you know, is the first in the process of three different presentations we will bring you over the course of the next seven or eight months um, prior to your approval of the working budget next September. Um, and so this is the high level view of where we begin the process um, and having to make a lot of assumptions between now and then, obviously. Um, and then we will continue to do work um, between um, the draft budget, the tentative budget, and the working budget. So at this, and we will include some information tonight on what we've been talking about, that second stimulus package we will be receiving very shortly uh, from the federal government. So I'll turn it over to CFO Cordelia Harden. Thank you. Uh, this budget is very preliminary, as Dr. Polio stated. The, it's the first of three budgets. The tentative budget will be in May and then the working budget in September. The budget includes projected revenue and expenses for our next fiscal year. It was developed from this current year budget, plus and minus any adjustments that we knew of at the time. Uh, the draft has to be submitted to you no later than January 31st. We have assumed some um, items within the development of this budget. We assume SEEK will remain at 4,000 per pupil. We assumed current staffing levels will be assumed uh, within this budget, and we've included expected increases. That's on the next slide. And um, property tax and occupational tax increases and salary adjustments for steps based on our current salary schedules. Also, we've included the expansion of Du Bois Academy and Grace James Academy. The total revenue for the, uh, this budget is 1.7 billion, and that includes state paid benefits as well as our beginning uh, balance for the general fund. Over 80% of the total budget is the general fund and all of the other funds are very restrictive. On the next two slides, you'll see a percentage and revenue breakdown of each of the funds. General fund includes state paid benefits and the estimated uh, beginning balance. Grants include local, state, and federal grants. 
Our nutrition service is, of course, the federal breakfast and lunch program. And the building fund is the required set aside from our local taxes for debt payment and capital improvement projects. The construction fund is the amount of the estimated bonding uh, that we will possibly issue this next year. Uh, the capital outlay is the amount required to be set aside from our state portion of SEEK revenue, and it's used also for the direct payment of construction cost as well as debt on our previous bonds. And then the other funds, uh, the 872000 is mainly the daycare uh, at TAP as well as adult ed, the enterprise um, component only. It does not represent the entire adult ed education program. Now let's dive a little deeper into the general fund. Out of the 1,358,000,000 in the total general fund, 996,000,000 is the actual expenses, that uh, revenue that can be uh, spent. The general fund receipts come from three main categories. The local, which includes property taxes, occupational taxes, and other items such as interest and payments in lieu of taxes. The state is mainly the SEEK at 218 million. And the federal indirect is the 3% charge that we um, put towards federal programs to offset the cost that we have for administrative and business operating costs such as payroll and accounts receivable and grants processing. With over 76% of our funding coming from the local community, we depend upon every resident and every business in Jefferson County School District, not just for funding, but also for engagement with our programs and being mentors and role models for our students. On the next slide, we will take a look at the financial support provided by district budget of 1.7 billion, 1.4 is general fund. State paid benefits include the employer health insurance portion, state life insurance and state paid teacher retirement contributions. How much of this budget goes directly to schools? Let's look at the details of the general fund budget for that. Over 85% of the total general fund budget is related directly to schools, with school support at almost 12%, which includes transportation cost. And only 3% of the draft budget is for business office expenses. On the next slide is a breakdown of our school allocation by level. Out of the 1.4 billion, 1.2 billion are related directly to the schools. The two light gray areas on the chart are the only portions that are not a direct school support. And that's administration business and administration instructional support. So what are our next steps? We began the communication of the budget allocations and the development of the tentative budget. The first week of February, the budget allocations will be communicated to schools and to the central office departments. Our next presentation to the board, we expect to be at the May 4th uh, board meeting with a, an approval request for May 25th. Then we'll be working on our working budget which will be reviewed in August and submitted to the board for approval on September 14th. But in addition to this overview, and it's, I know it's been a quick one, but uh, in addition to this draft overview, we wanna give you some information about the CARES funding. Uh, this is a summary of the education provisions within the $900 billion uh, National Relief Bill signed on December 27th. We briefly discussed this during our January 5th board meeting, but the great news is we now know that our initial allocation will be, as Dr. Polio mentioned in his superintendent's report, we will receive $178 million um, out of this bill. There is gonna be some additional funding, uh, but at this point, we don't know how much that is, and that'll be out of the governor's um, allocation. We also have estimated there's approximately 8 million that we're gonna receive through our nutrition service 
uh, program. On this slide here, uh, what we wanna do is compare the two um, items. What we call, it's Elementary Secondary School Emergency Relief. That's called ESSER. So it's ESSER 1 is the CARES Act. ESSER 2 is the CARISA Act. And you can see what those uh, initials stand for underneath there. So in March of 2020, uh, JCPS uh, for our benefit received $34.3 million for the ESSER and the GEARS combined. That's the governors and then this elementary education. Then in December, and we just now finding out uh, for ESSER II under uh, this CARISA Act, we will receive $178 million. Uh, the timeline, the main, one of the main differences is the timeline of availability. The ESSER 1 must be spent by September 30th, 2022, but ESSER 2 will be spent by September 30th, 2023. Most of the uh, items uh, are about the same as far as how we can spend the money, anything related to uh, COVID, the result of COVID. And one difference between the two, in the ESSER 1 funds, we had an allocation for the non-public schools, which we had to manage. But in the ESSER 2 funds, it appears we are not going to have to manage any non-public school funds, that the state is going to handle that, and it's a separate allocation. Next are the updates on the expenditures for the CARES Act themselves for May, the one that was issued in May of 2020. This slide is the expenditures of the eligible non-public schools in Jefferson County, which is the 1.3 million. And of that, they have spent uh, 639,000. Now, uh, when we first updated you on CARES, we told you that the non-public schools were going to receive 5.8 million of our allocation. But there were some complaints filed and to the federal government and that changed. And instead of the 5.8 million, the only amount we were required to allocate to non-public schools based on their low income students only is 1.3 million. So I mentioned this change you know, strictly because we had previously told you it would be a $5.8 million allocation. The next slide is a recap of what JCPS, how, what we have spent uh, are for the 34.3 million that we have um, received to be allocated. Hundred and fifty-five thousand social, emotional, mental health, and um, their uh, law. Thank you. And I said Cordelia too. I don't know if you have anything else to add. Well, I would just say, as a result of the federal funding, uh, I think some of the changes that we felt we might have to recommend, we can uh, now use this federal funding to help. Um, shore up the budget, but we still have an occupational tax um, issue as far as a reduction. It's not, it's getting better than it was last year, it appears, but again, it is not to the level that it should be, and that's one area of concern. Um, additional revenue from the tax increase, Dr. Polio and Cordelia. Um, can we track this in this budget or are we still holding on that pending resolution of the? It is not included in this budget okay. itself in the draft budget, only the 4%. The 4% is included. We are not including that until uh, the appeal is cleared. Okay. Um, that's what I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Board Member Craig, other questions? No questions. I have a question, um, Cordelia, about the money, the general fund money that goes to the local school. Uh, how does that money pay for training for teachers? 
there, there is uh, professional development that is included in some of the funding. We also have a separate funding on professional development that is a grant that uh, schools are able to um, use, but there is uh, funding included and uh, schools get that uh, allocation. I can get you the details. Uh, uh, let, let me pose a question to you. I have two Montessori schools in my district and they have not had adequate funding for professional development because the teachers come and go. But if we are truly on uh, offering Montessori programs to our students in those two elementary schools, I'm requesting uh, some solution to the problem because teachers deserve to be trained. Students deserve the best that we can give them. And both of the schools that I'm speaking of are schools that are uh, on my list of elementary schools that need more help. So I would like for you, if you don't mind, to get back to me as to how, since we're gonna have this money for three years, how we will uh, impact uh, and make sure that we will have training for the students that are in the Montes Montessori Elementary School, please. Both of the schools are in my district. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Okay, hearing none. Uh, at this time, is there a motion to receive the general fund draft budget for the fiscal year 2021-22? Is there a motion, please? Craig. Board member Craig, seconded by? McIntosh. Uh, board member McIntosh, thank you. Calling for the vote, starting with uh, Dr. Dr. Chris. Yes. Is that yes? Dr. Chris? Yeah. Okay, yes. thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, board Member Craig? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Board Member Marshall? Yes. Thank you. Board Member Duncan? Yes. Thank you. Dr. Shaw? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, board Member McIntosh? Yes. Thank you. And uh, Diane Porter, yes, it's unanimous. So the uh, motion uh, passes. Moving on uh, to the consent calendar, Dr. Polio, uh, if you would like to introduce that, and I would like some clarification because we received a uh, text and email this afternoon about something in personnel. So I'd like to know if that has been pulled or, or what is going on with that. Uh, yes, ma'am, we are pulling. Um the job description um, for the library media service clerk will bring it back at the next meeting. Okay, thank you so much. So at this time, is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? Because I, uh, consent calendar, I have no items that are to be pulled down, have not been made aware of any. So is there a motion to approve Marshall. the consent, consent calendar? Marshall. Okay, thank you, Mr. Marshall. Seconded by? Linda. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. Mm -hmm. Calling for the vote, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Chris. Yes. Thank you. Board Member Craig. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Board Member Marshall. Yes. Thank you. Board Member Duncan. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Shull. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Board Member McIntosh? Yes. Thank you. Diane Porter? Yes, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. So we have taken care of that. Uh, discussion on the board planning calendar. Is there any discussion on the board planning calendar? No discussion. Is there a motion to approve the planning calendar? Craig. Board member Craig seconded by. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Board member McIntosh, thank you. Calling for the vo vote, Dr. Chris. Yes. Thank you. Board member Craig. Yes. Thank you. Board member Marshall. Yes. Thank you. Board member Duncan. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Shule. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Board Member McIntosh. Yes. Thank you, 
Diane Porter, yes, that passes uh, unanimously. Are there any committee reports this evening from the board? Are there any board reports this evening? Ms. Porter? Governor Craig, yes, sir. I know that we're all uh, receiving um, emails from teachers with questions about the return to school plan. And it seems those emails have picked up in the last week since the vaccine announcement was made. Um, I just, I would like for all the teachers in JCPS to know um, that we're reading them, that we'll respond to them as soon as we can. They're coming in pretty quickly. Uh, let them know that we're in almost constant contact with uh, their elected uh, representative, Brent McKim. And we appreciate his advocacy on their part. Uh, we're in constant contact with Dr. Polio um, and we appreciate all the information that's coming from him and that we're gonna take these decisions over the coming weeks very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board reports? Okay, that completes the board reports. Uh, we are now moving down to the, uh, the adjournment. And before we adjourned, I did have two, two uh, quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King as we celebrate Dr. King. Two quick quotes. Uh, the urgent question to ask is what are we doing for others? And the second quote is our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. So at this time, which happens to be, what time is it? Uh, 8.36. Is there a motion at this time for adjournment, please? Marshall. Board member Marshall seconded by? Craig. Board member Craig calling for the vote, uh, starting with Dr. Chris. Yes. Thank you. Board Member Craig. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Board Member Marshall. Yes. Thank you. Board Member Duncan. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Shull. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Board Member McIntosh. Yes. Thank you. Diane Porter. Yes. Uh, thank you. We are officially adjourned. Thank you to the board and all the staff that has joined us tonight and for everyone that watched our board meeting. Please be safe uh, and we will see you at our next board meeting. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. Thank you.